All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, so, uh, my name is Bill Farner. I'm. Uh, yeah, we can close the doors, if you don't mind. Yeah, please. Um, so, given that we have a relatively small room, it's actually kind of nice, so we can be a little bit more interactive. So, if you have any questions midway through, want more detail on something that I kind of gloss over, feel free to interrupt, raise your hand. Uh, we can touch on some more uh, in-depth things if you want to. Um, first of all, a quick poll. Uh, I know these guys' answers, but uh, how many of you have never used Mesos before? Cool. And I assume also you've never used Aurora then. How about, uh, for those of you that have used Mesos, how many have used or know about Aurora a little bit? Awesome. Okay, so as I said, my name is Bill Farner. Uh, I've been working on uh, what's now known as Apache Aurora at Twitter for the last uh, roughly four years. Um, we have a team of, I think, around 10 engineers dedicated just to Aurora at the moment. Um, and it's driving a pretty significant portion of Twitter's uh, stateless infrastructure. So we've got a pr pretty big investment, uh, both in terms of engineering effort there, but also actual, like, uh, really using the software and, and battle testing it quite a bit in production. Uh, one thing that's a little bit challenging with Aurora is how to describe what it is. Um, there's a decent number of things, actually even within Apache, that are relatively similar to Aurora. I guess in the modern parlance, you'd consider it somewhere between infrastructure as a service and uh, platform as a service. Um, we're actually, actually, this is Chris, uh, who's the manager on the team, right, actually. And uh, we've been trying to dis decide exactly which one of those uh, we want to consider ourselves. And I still think we're kind of in the middle because we don't really have all the pieces yet. Um, but anyway, one, thing, one way to think about Aurora is sort of like a factory. Um, so if you've used something like, um, like Puppet or Chef before, you're probably used to writing these things that are kind of like recipes for, uh, so these things that are kind of like recipes for what you actually want to run. Uh, and that's not terribly different with Aurora. So you kind of write this configuration file that describes what you want to execute. And it's going to go ahead and do that for you kind of on the, the terms that you ask for it. Um, but that's only kind of half the story. That kind of describes the scheduler. So the scheduler is given these, these instructions for what to run and how to run it. There's also a client, which is where you actually generate these, these things that are the, the templates. So in that scenario, it's kind of like a factory factory. Um, however, this is not really a very popular description. So uh, we'll try a different one instead. Um, so another way to think about it is kind of like uh, these, these descriptions that you're writing are like uh, rubber stamps. So the client helps you kind of carve out these rubber stamps to tell the scheduler in the system what you want to run, and it's going to go ahead and use that over and over um, based on like how many, for example, you want to run or how frequently or uh, on what schedule. And with that metaphor, the Aurora scheduler is kind of like a place to hold all of these stamps. So it's, it's going to persist them, hang on to them, uh, use them when you want to. Um, but it doesn't really know what any of these stamps are. So the Aurora scheduler is pretty agnostic to what it's actually executing. It's just acting on instructions that it's been given. And there are other parts of the system that figure out how to actually use those. And with this kind of system, with any, uh, anything that can be considered infrastructure as a service, uh, it obviously really shines when you're into a, a really big cluster. Um, so this is awesome because even at, at Twitter, we're able to use a relatively um, small SRE staff to manage a really large fleet of machines, which is pretty invaluable. So it, it uh, forces us to use a lot of automation. It provides a lot of automation. Um, but it also provides features to, to keep Twitter up, basically. So um, as you can see, in a data center, you have kind of different, different axes of, of failures that you can get into. There's machine failure. There's rack failure. There's row failure. Uh, and Aurora provides constructs to provide uh, kind of upfront resistance to all of those types of failures to make sure that things are placed in a way such that if those different things start to fail, um, you can both react, but you can also be assured that you don't lose your whole service by losing one particular machine, row, or rack. Um, on the other side of that, it's, it's kind of, we've never really discussed what the lower bound looks like for what something uh, like Aurora can be useful for. Um, and kind of the same goes for Mesos. And, and so I guess Mesos and Aurora are kind of similar here, where um, it's, it's not really clear at what point you start to need something like that. Um, and to kind of give an idea of what the overhead looks like, uh, for anything reasonably reliable, you'd want to run at least three what's called master machines. Uh, so you can host your zookeeper there, which is used for coordination and leader election. 
um, and you can host your, uh, your master there from ASOS and the Aurora scheduler. So that's kind of the fixed overhead, and you can get pretty far with just those three machines. Uh, as you get into a really large cluster, you probably want to go to something like five or seven, but, um, but if you think about, about just this three machine overhead, um, even when you get, I'd say, into the eight to 10 machine range, it starts to make a lot of sense to pay that fixed cost because then you can start to uh, add and remove machines on the fly without having to worry much about reconfiguring and doing all the sysadmin work uh, on those individual machines. Um, and something like Mesos and Aurora are really helpful for uh, building in redundancy into the system and automating redundancy. Um, and I'm sure you, you all know redund redundancy is really useful both for resistance to failure but also for performance. So if you want to, uh, it's a popular term is scaling, if you want to scale up uh, double your service size um, with something like Aurora, that's really easy to do. It's literally just changing one number in a configuration file and pushing it. Um, and kind of in this metaphor as well, you, there, there are um, applicable descriptors for how Mesos and Aurora uh, play into that. So in, in like a RAID controller, you can consider um, Mesos is kind of like the, uh, the disk controller. So it's interfacing with individual machines or individual disks. Uh, it understands how to talk to those machines, how to figure out what exactly they are and, and what features they have. And in that, in that uh, situation, Aurora is kind of like the software RAID controller. So it's being uh, made aware of all those resources and it figures out what to put on, on those, those disks or machines and where uh, and when. And it's gonna do things like adapt to loss of a disk uh, to replace things that, that were on the, the lost hardware. Uh, there, there are some design sort of restrictions that come along with this, uh, and one of those is to kind of build in the idea of traveling light. So uh, currently Aurora is most suitable for things that uh, we, what we call stateless. So things that you can just pick up and move uh, on the fly are, are best suited. Uh, this, this is both useful uh, to actually fit into the system so that, because we don't offer any kind of persistence currently, uh, we kind of, uh, we count on uh, basically storage systems to provide that service. Um, but basically you're expected to kind of use stateless things uh, and try to be as least concerned with placement of processes um, and uh, be able to start up without like having really long warm up times. Um, this makes you fit in really well and let you scale up and down really quickly. Uh, and another angle of this traveling light is that Aurora doesn't really impose much of anything on things running within the system. Um, sometimes with things that are considered a PaaS, uh, you have to like fit into a framework or fit into an API or code against an API. With Aurora, you don't have to do that. Basically, if you run, if you run in Bash, you can run in Aurora because uh, that's literally all we're doing is running, uh, running shell code. Oh, and one, one other thing with traveling light. Um, so we don't do any kind of like software divine, defined networking or anything like that. Um, so basically, we, we count on at the application level currently to do things like service discovery, service registration, um, and also the, the individual applications are expected to be agnostic to, for example, what port they're listening on. So you, you kind of need to get away from things like having configuration files with static uh, socket addresses and things like that. Uh, as for the actual implementation of Aurora, um, as with any good distributed system, there are lots of layers this can both, uh, this is both good from a, a development perspective, but also kind of daunting when you try to grok the system and understand how exactly it works. Um, but so some of the layers that are, that are most important there are, uh, there's the, the Mesos master and slave, which uh, are kind of like the, the core of the onion, if you will. Um, then we have the scheduler and executor. So if you've never used Mesos before, uh, programming against Mesos, you usually develop a framework uh, the framework at the, at the minimum requires a scheduler, which is basically that, that software RAID controller. It's, been, it's being made aware of uh, resources in the cluster. It's deciding what to execute there. Uh, the executor is optional in Mesos. We do implement our own because, uh, as you'll see, we have kind of a, a sophisticated uh, configuration system that we use to, to actually execute things so you can do workflows. So uh, again, with the layers, we have our executor, which is uh, basically completely agnostic to the scheduler. They're actually, the, both of these parts of the system are completely unaware of each other for the most part. Um, and then finally we have the client, which is you know, what you interface with mostly. It's the command line. Um, it's, this is that thing that you pass your, your rubber stamps, if you will, to. And, um, and finally, there's the configuration language itself, which is yet another component that is completely abstracted from the rest of the system. It's actually its own project. 
So the, the language that you use to describe configurations doesn't know anything about uh, the scheduler or the executor for the most part. Uh, and as you'll see, I'll, I'll describe that in a little bit. So to kind of really dumb down the, the concept of the scheduler and executor in some slightly more technical terms, the scheduler is basically just a, a huge series of state machines uh, and also the replicated storage. So for those of you that are familiar with Mesos, um, we use what, what's called the replicated log. So this is, this is an API and a, and a kind of subsystem that, that the, the Mesos library comes along with. Um, so this allows us to do quorum-based persistence of these state machine transitions. And this gives us really high um, durability in the face of, of failures of machines at that master level. Uh, and again, I mentioned the executor. Uh, at the simplest level, the executor is basically a thing that uh, is very complicated but executes bash commands uh, and also does health checking. So uh, in addition to monitoring the actual process liveness, we will uh, optionally do HTTP pings of, of your application to make sure it's still alive. Um, this is good if you uh, are worried about things like deadlocks um, so that we can actually notice failure uh, above the process level. So um, one thing I've, I've said before that uh, in, in previous talks is a lot of the most interesting features of Aurora are actually not really user facing. They're all, they're all kind of buried. Um, and that's because most of them are, are around resiliency um, and around being able to run very large clusters. Um, I mentioned at, at Twitter, we run a pretty large installation of Aurora and we, we try to basically get ourselves out of the business of policing users as much as possible. And this comes in, in the form of building all kinds of durability uh, systems into the schedule, into the executor, um, <clears throat> rather than you know, trying to actually track people down and tell them not to do certain bad things. Um, so there's a lot of things like rate limiting, um, a lot of things like uh, input checking all over the place where we try to make sure that you can't really harm the system even if you really try to. So this is an example of uh, at least part of a configuration that would you would use to launch a job in Aurora. So, uh, so here all we're defining is a uh, task, and at the top you can see the resources. So if you've used Mesos before, this probably looks a little bit familiar. Um, this is basically what we're going to match against the shape of the resource offers that are coming from the master. So uh, there's actually a little bit of overhead on top of this because we do have to actually run the executor. Um, that's pretty much trivial. Um, but CPU and RAM and disk are the, the three kind of core um, resource vectors that are used in Mesos. Uh, you can have others, but these are the, the, uh, the primary ones that we stick to. Uh, and then we have the task definition. So there's several things going on here. Um, and when you first read this, you probably start to wonder, why, why am I writing this, this list of processes? This looks really complicated to just unzip and run something. And it definitely is. Uh, for something as simple as this, it kind of makes little sense, and we're kind of thinking about ways to improve that so you don't have to write so many characters just to, just to download, unzip, and execute something. But um, there's actually, a, uh, kind of goes to the, the under the hood aspect where when you're using the really basic functions, it may seem rather verbose, but when you start to do more complicated things, uh, especially with the task description, it starts to make more sense that um, you, know, you can do things like have processes that we execute locally on the machine over and over until, uh, until we reach some kind of failure limit. Uh, we can do things like uh, run processes in parallel. And again, these are all things that you can definitely do in Bash, but uh, we find it easier to, um, so a lot of people describe it here. Sometimes writing some of those workflows in Bash can be rather complicated. Um, but in addition, we kind of have more visibility from the execution layer when you do break things out into processes. So you can look at, for example, this, the, uh, the standard error and standard output from these individual processes, see how they, how they failed, how often we've executed them. Uh, and then once you have the task, you can be, need to compose that into a job. So this is uh, an additional um, noun that we introduce on top of Mesos. So the task, that was kind of like that rubber stamp. That's the description of what you actually want to execute. The job is the description of how many of those you want to run and under what terms you want them to run. Um, so in this case, this, this is a description of a, a 50 instance uh, kind of on-demand execution of something. Um, there are other configuration parameters that you could use to, to uh, actually, I take that back, this is a service. Uh, you would see job instead of service at that outer level. 
Um, so a service, this, this is actually something that is kind of more like a server, so we're going to be running this forever, and we'll try to keep it most uh, 50 instances up at any given time. And there are also some additional um, like kind of default parameters that we plug into this. Um, so we kind of, once, once you say that you're a service, we have some basic assumptions about what you actually want to do. So, um, so we, we will inject, uh, for example, uh, rack diversity and machine diversity constraints. So this instructs the scheduler to, smart, uh, to intelligently place things as we schedule them. So that again, if like the rack goes down or the machine goes down, your whole service isn't hosted there. So that you still have some, some resistance to failure at that level. Uh, so at this point, I'll, I'll do a quick demo. Um, so this is basically just going through the, the tutorial. So most of our docs, we've tried to keep them in Markdown, um, and Apache mirrors our repository onto GitHub. So they're all rendered there in our docs folder. So literally all I'm gonna do is just crib things directly from the tutorial and kind of show you how it works and what you have to do to run the tutorial. I've already got my file created, apparently. And uh, again, you'll, you'll probably see the verbosity start to show here. And mostly this is because we're trying to describe exactly how everything works. So rather than make everything compact into like as few lines as we can, uh, you can see we have inline comments here to help you understand what exactly is going on. Okay, so I've got both my files already. So um, I'm using the, the create verb with the Aurora client. Um, I'm passing the key, so that, that first, actually you probably can't read that. So the first parameter there was what we call the job key. So um, the reason that you have this, and instead of just passing the configuration, is you can define as many jobs as you want within a configuration. So you could imagine if you have like a uh, a service that's made up of several different actual components. You might want to define them all together, share configuration parameters together. Um, that's kind of what we designed for. So uh, most commands are, are used uh, by, by scoping things with that job key, and then we pass the actual configuration. Uh, the client has told me that we have uh, a task pending, so we can go and check out how it's actually working. So this is the, the sort of home page of the scheduler. Uh, it's pretty boring right now because we only have one role running, but uh, you can imagine in a, a larger cluster you'd have many more things here, uh, and that search box starts to become a little bit more useful. And here's the actual job. Um, so you can see that uh, it's running. It shows some more details about how it actually came to be where it is. Uh, so when it first started up, it was in the pending state. That's basically where we're wait waiting for offers from the master to actually figure out where we can run this thing. Um, we match an offer, actually start to execute it, and uh, we hear back from the executor that it's running. So this is where the, the breakout of the different processes, like I mentioned, we have, we have more power in the executor when you, when you break out those, uh, those different commands into separate process, like capital P process objects. Um, so we can show the actual breakdown of how long each thing took to run uh, you can see its, its output individually. Um, and you can also actually browse into the, the trut. Um, so this is that the sandbox directory. If you've used Mesos before, we just execute in there. Um, and as you can see, our actual script lives in there. So if you had like a jar, for example, and you were trying to debug, you can actually download that and, and inspect it if you think something's wrong with the individual application. So this is the application running. It's a basic hello world Python script, so it's not terribly exciting what it's doing, but this is kind of the basic workflow and the different uh, interfaces that you would use to launch an application, um, to debug it, to look at its output. Uh, and again, if we had things like log files, they would all land in that troot. Uh, 
Um, so it, as it turns out, I, uh, by having those files pre-baked, I already skipped a step. But uh, what I can do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to modify the <coughs> script to actually break it. So the way, if you followed the tutorial, you'd see that there was actually a syntax error that we put in intentionally in the Python <coughs> script just to show you kind of how you would notice and how you would diagnose when things are broken. So since my job is running, I'm going to update it. And what, what's going to happen here is the client will start to do a rolling upgrade. Um, a rolling upgrade of one process is not terribly exciting, um, but if you had like 100 or 1,000, you would see it walk through in batches. Um, and it will actually do an automatic rollback. So this will be my first time trying this in a demo, but you should see it actually um, watch and then roll back on uh, the failing application. Yeah, so it started to fail because I put that uh, I put that syntax error in, as, and as you can see, so we had one fail, uh, and then the client noticed that that the newly started service was not staying alive, so it went ahead and rolled it back to the old configuration. And you know, if you wanted to figure out why your your, your roll, uh, upgrade failed, you can see the output here in the standard error. So there's a couple of places uh, in here in the scheduler, or sorry, in the client output. Um, it has some error lines. So it notifies you that the upgrade or the update was reverted. Um, and you can see the individual process failures in there. And, and the way that was, was noticed was because the, the process actually exited non-zero. So uh, the executor transitions it to the failed state. Uh, and the, the client notices that by interfacing with the scheduler. And, and again, like this is done in a, in a like batched rolling fashion. So uh, depending on the scenario, you might not notice it so quickly. You might get to like 90% and then for, for whatever reason things start to fail. Um, but it'll always automatically roll back. And there are all sorts of knobs that you can configure there for like the rate at which you, you, uh, you upgrade and like what kind of thresholds you want for how many tasks have to fail before you can consider it uh, a failed upgrade. And, uh, and of course, we can see now that we are back to the old script. Oh, I clicked on the wrong one. Ah, OK. So the, the rollback actually didn't work. Um, and the reason for that is because the, the script is actually stored on the host, which is really bad form. Um, and that's just basically to make the Vagrant setup easier. Normally, you would have either like a version file, basically something identifying the, the, uh, the uh, immutable package. So the problem here is that the package itself, the Python script, was mutable, and it's stored on the host. So the, the upgrade couldn't, or sorry, the rollback couldn't really do anything because the script has changed. So it kind of made for a, for a bad demo, but um, the, the point still stands that it will automatically roll back. And if, you know, if we had hello.py.v2 or something like that, uh, it would have done the right thing because those separate files would have been independent. Um, yeah, um, so I don't know if the recording will pick that up, but the question is how do you deal with legacy applications that are already listening on static ports and need to be advertised with a load balancer? Um, so we don't have a great built-in story for that right now. This would be kind of an additional layer on the onion that we would build, um, but you can fairly easily do that kind of thing um, external to, to Aurora or even Kind of, you, you could have a separate service that manages that and notices that things are, are running, or you could kind of run something at startup uh, within your application. So you know you could run some little advertiser thing and then run your legacy app. Um, but you, yeah, you'd basically have to write your own code to interface with your load balancer and uh, let it know like that I'm on this IP and I've been assigned this port. Um, static ports are a little bit harder. Like if, the, if it is strictly static as opposed to something that you can. Uh, like let the application know to listen on a specific port um, just because then you start to, to worry about things like collisions. Um, if you wanted to do sort of higher level um, software-defined networking, 
you could do that, but we definitely don't have anything built in for that right now. So one way would be the, the description, like the easiest POC kind of a thing would be uh, schedule uh, in a sense that uh, instruct the scheduler not to put the same sort of process in the same post? Yeah, so y you could absolutely do that. You could kind of um, sort of build that restriction in with the constraints that we provide. Uh, that would be fairly easy. Unfortunately, we Aurora is defined or designed to run services very reliably, so it, it errs on the side of availability. So what I mean by that is you could actually run into like a momentary collision on a, on a specific host. For example, if the master, the Mesos master, loses communication with the slave, we might actually schedule something on there again before the master notices and uh, mm -hmm. and kind of reaps the old process. So you could have brief collisions. Um, it's a great question. I will get into that a little bit. So there's kind of some, some sort of missing components that uh, I'll kind of point out. And that is one of them. Oh, so the last thing that, uh, that uh, you need to do, so we have kind of the full crud um, uh, verbs. So the, the D would be kill. So we're going to kill, in this case I'll use kill all. So kill all is saying kill the entire job completely as opposed to kill, which lets you kind of pluck off individual instances if you had uh, a larger service. And actually, one kind of neat thing here that I haven't seen in, or shown in a uh, demo before is, uh, so you see this task is in the throttled state. So this is one of these resiliency features. So uh, if you've used, if you've coded against Mesos before, you may know sort of some of the different limitations within the API. But even that aside, uh, it would be really horrible if a scheduler in a system like this were sort of DDoSed by Thing is restarting very rapidly, especially as you get to like hundreds or thousands of jobs and many, many more instances and, and, uh, and hosts. So, so we have different uh, features in place to kind of be resilient to that. So one of these is the throttled state, where if we notice something restart, like basically every time we restarted this, um, you can see towards the right, it stayed alive for just a handful of seconds each time. And this is a threshold that we have built into the scheduler where when we notice that we're, something is being run um, in a way that it's supposed to recycle every time it dies, um, we eventually will back off on that task and put it into the throttled state so that we're not wasting our, our, our resources, like, because the, the scheduler resources are kind of precious and, and uh, few. So, so we try to basically reserve that for things that actually need to reschedule, as opposed to something that is probably looking fateless or uh, hopeless to try to reschedule. But we will, we will retry indefinitely. Oh, and we'll go back to that kill. Uh, so the kill command completed, and the tasks are all gone, so they're all in the completed area now. So as you mentioned, uh, there, there are obviously some components that are not fully there yet, so sort of some layers of the onion that we have not yet either publicly released or just don't, haven't formulated yet at all. So it might look kind of like an ad lib or a mad libs thing where uh, you get to a, po a point and realize there's just nothing there to fill some particular void. Uh, so one of those is service discovery. Um, so if you're running a service, we do assign ports. We do a lot of the sort of uh, bare metal type stuff to get your thing actually executing and running in a way that doesn't collide with other uh, applications that are on the host. But we don't really have any out of the box way to let you advertise your presence. Um, as it turns out, we, we do have that at Twitter. So we kind of, we build in the registration part. So we have um, basically just one little line that you put in your configuration that um, announces your service via Zookeeper. Uh, that's been a fairly common way to, to do that kind of thing. So that's, that's the, the way that we've adopted as well. Um, on the client side of that, we don't have anything even at Twitter. So it's, we find it just more performant and uh, we're able to sort of control the application landscape enough that we can basically say all, all clients must be able to speak Zookeeper service discovery. Um, and of course, there are numerous ways. Um, you know, there are things like, um, like at, at Amazon, there are sort of software configurable load balancers. So you can do that kind of approach. Um, Zookeeper is kind of nice because it's decentralized and 
um, and fairly hands-off um, and, and has sort of less, um, less traffic bottleneck. Um, but this is something that we'll be looking very soon into actually introducing in the, into the project proper. Um, but again, that would be just the registration side, not the discovery side. Um, there are open source libraries for the JVM that we have that can do this actually for Python as well. Um, but as far as other landscapes, um, I'm not really familiar what's out there, but that's kind of our, our sort of language core competency. Uh, authentication is another big thing that's missing in the open source project. Uh, on this, both the scheduler and the client side, so that, that's where we, we do the authentication currently. Um, there are sort of ways that you can plug in custom code to do your own authentication. We don't have anything in the open, open source project right now. And this was kind of uh, an artifact of trying to get the minimum viable product out for open sourcing. So uh, I didn't mention, we, we entered the incubator in November, so it's relatively recent. Uh, and there are some features that we still have to flesh out, and this is one of them. Uh, in a multi-user system, it's basically all a, a gentleman's agreement um, or honor system, if you will, uh, because the, the authentication that we provide is basically none. Um, but again, this is something that we're looking to actually put into the open source project fairly soon. Um, and this is a, actually a place where we'll probably be seeking input from the community to try to make sure that we do it in a way that helps most people out. Um, at, at Twitter, for example, and I know other companies have the same situation where they kind of have like a bespoke um, authentication system that's not necessarily industry standard, and that's kind of how we are as well. So it really wouldn't make, would have made any sense for us to open source what we had. Um, and so finally, that, that's basically it for the talk, and uh, you're welcome to contact us. Uh, our website is aurora.apache.org. Uh, we have a Twitter account managed by Dave Lester over here. Uh, uh, at Apache Aurora, and our uh, Twitter hashtag and also our IRC channel on, on Freenode is Aurora. So if you're gonna try out the tutorial or try to get Aurora installed, uh, feel free to either email our dev list or if you want more uh, r rapid response, you can try our IRC channel. We're actually pretty responsive in there. We try to do as much of our team communication there as we can. Uh, so so try, us, try us there first. Um, again, that's it for the, the actual talk, uh, so I'm happy to answer questions now, Any, anything you might want to know about the project, where it's going, where it came from, or other things that are missing. Yeah. Um, 10,000. 10,000 jobs should be fine. So there are sort of different um, axes of, of scale that really apply to the scheduler. Um, jobs are sort of interesting. Uh, what's actually more interesting, though, is tasks, or instances, rather. So um, the, the anatomy of a job is that it's made up of many instances. And each instance has sort of a generational life cycle where there are many tasks. Um, so you could think of that as the sort of uh, repetitive invocation of something like, for example, a service will run will run indefinitely. Um, I think I think ten thousand should be no problem. Um, we're actually uh, I think we're doing a scale testing in the next couple of weeks for actually yeah, and I think that is actually our threshold that we're going to be scale testing for. So ten thousand should be, should be no problem. As far as if you're thinking of tasks, we can definitely go way past ten thousand tasks, and, and we have done that. And I think our our new threshold is going to be 100,000 tasks, for, but I think even that will probably be no problem. Not for job, total. Total, yeah. But thousands of tasks within a job is also feasible, and we've done it in practice. So what's the in production, for example, at Twitter? How do you, how do you check, for example, the scheduler uh, use? Like in the case of Aurora, from a nine time input. So is that what you do? So it's like the Aurora <coughs> job? So this is to like um, kind of see how it's performing or that it's not getting backlogged. Yeah, see all the jobs. Oh sure. Um, well, as far as all the jobs, I don't know if we have a. Mm, we do have a list jobs. Without using the UI. Um, it's a good question. We have we have sort of a. So I use the Aurora tool. We have an Aurora admin tool that kind of provides sort of more uh, under the hood functionality like that. I can't remember if it has that particular feature. Um, at least without doing like grep and uh, unique. Uh, what were you going to say? You can use the query to manage 
Yeah. yeah. But I mean, even if that feature doesn't exist, that's something that we would have no problem implementing. Uh, what are you trying? What are you trying to accomplish? Uh, no, I just have you know, I've experienced with batch processing, so I'm just trying to understand you know, how do I do this. I understand it's not a batch. Yeah, yeah. It's for long-running services, but let's say you have tons of jobs that are still pending. And you wanna there, there is actually pending yet. Right? Yeah, so there are kind of some debug endpoints that you they, they just spit out JSON. Uh, right now, we have an empty list of pending tasks, but um, I can pretty. In practice, what we find is that things don't stay in pending too long because for long-running services like this, you really size your cluster to be able to handle things as they come in. So things are really just sitting in pending long enough to find the right new batch for resources. Um, and sometimes the way people get stuck in pending is they ask for ridiculous. Yeah, so I'm going to ask for 100 CPUs. And uh, so this is kind of an internal throttling. You know, I mentioned the, the throttled state, but there's actually internal throttling just to try to satisfy a task because, again, that, that's a, there's a, a upper bound to the amount of CPU resource we have to try to satisfy pending tasks. Uh, so internally, when we're trying to satisfy a, a, an existing pending task, we'll start to back off on it if we're not finding resources that match. So this this would, this is kind of our debug endpoint right now, where like in this case we're gonna we'll try to satisfy this task again in about 16 seconds, um, and it actually does grouping. So each of the 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 heterogeneous tasks within a job will all land within the same bucket. Um, so if I had more instances in this job you would see that, that task IDs array grow, but we only will look at one of those tasks in 16 seconds, but if they're being satisfied, we'll, we'll chew through that very rapidly. Yeah, so, so yes. Um, so that, that's kind of a feature that our primitive that Mesos makes available to us. So when it notices that a task, uh, sorry, a, a slave has lost connectivity, uh, or you know, for whatever reason, if it, the, the master can't talk to a slave, it considers that slave lost and then lets the scheduler know uh, all the active tasks that were on that, um, that slave. It'll say that those tasks were all lost. And the, the internal state machine in the scheduler kind of has built in paths for handling things that are entering the lost state. And I think every single state, if it's coming from active to lost, it, it's rescheduled, whether it's a, a service or not. Um, and so you mentioned batch. So we, we do some aspect of batch as well. I didn't mention this yet, but um, in the configuration syntax, when you declare a job, you can give a cron schedule. So, so we can run things on a cron schedule. Um, this is another thing that's kind of uh, one of those missing pieces because uh, as a part of getting the minimum viable product out for the, uh, the release, uh, we noticed that we were using a, an Apache license incompatible library, so we had to kind of rip that part out. Um, but we're actually in review, a like code review right now to get that back in. So within the next, like I'd say, week or so, we're trying to get it before our first like official Apache release to have that in. But, but so yeah, we do some, some aspect of batch as well. So we have a little bit of time left, so I can show you um, sort of a more involved um, demo. So, so I mentioned about service registration and discovery, um, but I haven't really talked about how you actually get a port assigned to you. So there's kind of, uh, if you've used mustache before, we kind of do like a mustache templating like thing to inject uh, a port, uh, port number, an allocated port number into your command line. So I'm just gonna basically retrofit my hello world. Um, let's see if I remember. Make sure that's okay. 
Um, the executor and client of it are. The scheduler is in Java. I'm just going to, so if you've used Python simple HTTP server before, just going to do what it says, brings up a simple HTTP server. I just want to make sure I uh, serve something interesting. So uh, this kind of shows where uh, I mentioned you might start to blur the lines between just writing Bash and writing the, the like sort of um, first class configuration language. And I've done that here. I wrote just a simple sequence of commands. I could have broken the, the CD out into its own, I think, although I'm not sure if the working directory would persist across those. But nonetheless, I'm just trying to show something more interesting. OK, so I've got the simple HTTP server up and running. And uh, you might notice there's a new thing in here that, that uh, we have a link. Uh, and this is basically the, the scheduler notices that it's been allocated, or it's, it's been asked to allocate a port named HTTP. So there are kind of some magic uh, strings that float around in the system, and this is one of them. So we take HTTP to kind of um, make it a little easier to, to do some basic functionality. And in this case, uh, we just provide a convenience link to go directly to that port uh, on the assumption that it is actually using the HTTP protocol because you asked for it to be named that. Um, if you didn't call it HTTP, you're going to probably get something really crazy here if you click on that link. Um, but if you've ever used the Python simple HTTP server before, this probably looks relatively familiar. It's just serving the directory that, um, that, I, that I placed it in. Um, and the actual contents here are probably not that interesting. If I click on one of these, it'll probably just download it. So uh, if I had some HTML files, you would see the HTML rendered. But that's not really exciting. It's kind of the configuration that is the, the more interesting part. Um, so, if, so we can look at the actual command that the executor ran. Uh, and as you can see, that this is the exact command that I, that I templated, with the exception of the, the port being uh, dropped in with a dynamically allocated one. Um, so not terribly complex uh, or, or sophisticated, but that's just kind of how you, you do those basic components to have a port assigned. And you could do things like advertise with the load balancer if you wanted to. Uh, <laughs> One you should ask. Um, do we? Yeah, I mean, I guess yes. Well, some, some That, that's been a sensitive one, because uh, lots of large infrastructure is really sensitive to loss of cache, so there's been some resistance to put that into a dynamic system. Um, we do have, we have some means in Aurora to run things on fixed hosts, and we basically developed that as um, a way to have a, a, a path for things that are legacy to get into the system that are maybe not ready for it. So we've, we've dabbled with doing things that do actual persistence to disk, so they actually Right to local disk, so we've run a couple of storage systems in Aurora, uh, without, <laughs> and without any problem. Um, however, it, those type of things make our team scale much more poorly, um, just because we have to be really extra careful with those hosts as opposed to everything else, which we can kind of act more uh, more rapidly with, and um, the hosts are all configured exactly the same. But uh, you can definitely do th things like that if you know the deployment model and the the monitoring system or monitoring model uh, fits better or if it's easier to just deploy things all, all in the same way. So one thing I noticed was some people, I, I don't know whether this is the right answer to it. They let the dynamic thing run. Then they figured it out and do a TCP proxy to that guy. Yeah, so. And that's why I, and the, I don't know how performant that will be. Mm -hmm. Because for production, the over-provision, so we might get away with it. Right. But, 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of a tough thing to, to come up with a great solution for. Uh, so I think you, you may be thinking of Marathon. I know Marathon has uh, is a similar system, and it has, uh, I think, a way that you can just ask for an HA proxy instance to be run in tandem. And Yeah, exactly. Um, so, and, and we actually have something like that in-house where we have a, a, a proxy service that is just a, a TCP connection proxy that we use for legacy applications that can't do service discovery so that they can still talk to things in that dynamic world. Um, and yeah, it looks a lot like HA proxy, uh, except we, like with HA proxy, it, it assumes a configuration on the file system and you have to update that and, and tell it to, to reload. Uh, with this thing, we kind of already have our standardized <coughs> announcing system in Zookeeper, so we can, like, at least the discovering of services is a little bit different in that case. But the mechanism is, the core idea is the same. Absolutely. And the other thing I want to uh, ask is, like, if you go to the bad side, see, long learning process, I can understand that uh, if, if, for example, application, you have to keep uh, your processing very close to the data, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's something that we've we've basically done more than just do thought experiments on. Um, I think our our current plan is basically to delegate to systems that are designed from from the from scratch to do that kind of thing, like Hadoop. Um, so this is this is where kind of stepping down to the Mesos layer is probably more appropriate to let another scheduler come in and run in tandem as another framework in the same cluster and do that kind of more sophisticated batch oriented logic. So for for Cassandra and React and all those things, the problem is the same, right? So yeah, if you didn't have uh, have the Hadoop file system as your data, you mean? Yeah. So. Um, yeah, that's something we definitely don't have an answer for. Uh, that, that use case hasn't really popped up for us yet, but I could definitely see that being one. The, the challenge there is uh, you kind of have to start running all these things on the same hosts. Uh, so you know you need your Aurora and your, uh, your Cassandra data node to be running in tandem on the same machine in order to actually take advantage of that locality, even if we could do it. Uh, and that's, like at least for, for our purposes at Twitter, has not really been how we've run the infrastructure. but. Um, I mean, it's a feature that I think I would entertain if you really wanted to, to push for it. I think it would be practical. Uh, for Cassandra, it's a little bit forgiving. Uh, for React and all those things, what happens is if you still kind of bring them up, uh, the code itself is not stable to do whatever the repair job is they're doing. Mm -hmm. So people are very paranoid. So they persist everything there, load it, and just sync up the lost state. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they take forever and ever because the amount of data we are talking is huge. Uh, it's so for those cases, I don't know whether it's worth uh, spending, but uh, we have to keep an eye on those things because uh, yeah. depends on the installed rate. So Cassandra, I can understand that we might get over it. Yeah. So just to be clear, you're talking about something uh, I'm not familiar with React, but something maybe like a Redis where you you do kind of warm the cache locally on disk so that you can come up faster, like that kind of thing. But, but Right. Yeah. So our, our story so far has been any kind of um, anything so persistent. Yeah. Exactly. So. But, but we. Yeah. 
But we, we have talked about doing things like scheduling hints to maybe not require placement on that, that particular node, but prefer it. Um, and this would actually help us in some other ways, like we do, like the, uh, the diversity constraints that we have, those are actually hard requirements, but we've talked about kind of making those a little bit more, um, more loose requirements, and um, you can imagine other kind of soft hints coming into that where something external might, might request place, a specific placement. Um, the problem is if the, everything's dynamically scheduled, then you might wind up like kind of chasing your data around the cluster. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so we're up on time, so I'm going to let the room go. But uh, if you have any follow-up questions, I'll probably be hanging around the, the, the atrium in here for a while. So feel free to, to track me down or Chris or Dave, and we'll be, be happy to talk to you more about it. So thanks for coming. Thanks.